Okay. As usual, it takes a bit of time before I'm uh, <laughs> I'm online. I hope you can see me now and hear me. Hi, Miles. You can hear me. You can see me. <laughs> then we can get started if it works. If it's working. Okay. Uh, so welcome. Uh, it took less time than last time to get started. I'm beginning to <coughs> learn how it works. So I hope uh, it will be better next time. Uh, I will meet, meet Louise in the mess here so we can practice a little bit and take some notes to learn how to do it. But uh, we can uh, we can begin if you want to. If anybody has a question you would like to pose, uh, you can write in the chat as usual. And then uh, I'll try to give an answer uh, to the best of my uh, abilities. Uh, so I'm waiting basically now. <laughs> How many people are there? I don't know. Not 10, I think. Yeah. Michael Tweet, um, the box, Miles, Louise, Maratwai, Alberto, Francisco, Para. Okay. Um, that's good if we can see in here. Now we uh, need to find a couple of questions to get the question and answers part of this. Uh, Get going, high keys. Uh, yes, uh, Luis would like me to say a few words about the lecture that I will be doing at the end, uh, the qu questions and answers uh, section. Uh, it's a uh, uh, I'll get to the next question after this. Uh, Basically, it's a two-part lecture. In the first part, I'll uh, talk a little bit about Boyron and Heidegger's more or less uh, religious inclined uh, understanding of the night, based to a large extent on the divisity he had with uh, Elizabeth Blochmann to Boyron. And in the second part, I uh, do an elucidation, you could say, call it that, uh, of uh, some poems uh, that uh, Tarkel wrote one of Heidegger's favorite poets, and uh, they're all concerned with the night and the experience of the night. So if you're interested, uh, when we finish with this part, and uh, I will give it or present it. Um, Keith is writing that he is. Uh, Fabian, nice to see you. To make a distinction between being and being, so the the difference between the sign with the epsilon and sign with the y, or the i, the sign with, with the i, and the sign with the y. Um, I think uh, the be best way to understand it is that uh, in the beginning of philosophy. The first experience, you could say, of of being that happened in early Greek thinking was formulated in this famous uh, saying of Parmenides that uh, being and being aware or being and thinking are the same. But the being that was understood at the beginning of uh, of this your philosophy became the let's say the metaphysical understanding of being, and this is of course the being with the eye, which uh, to put it very quickly was, re the, was formulated as the question about the beingness, what makes beings to, being, and the answer usually is to look for the, the highest kind of being or the being that is uh, 
expressing being in the most uh, complete sense. Uh, of course, in, uh, in Christian philosophy, it becomes God, who is the, the creator of all being. Uh, but at the end of this of metaphysics, uh, you can see the limitation of this understanding of being. And uh, that's when Heidegger starts talking about being with the why. And uh, the difference is that uh, the being with the why discloses itself in the history of philosophy, you could say, as being with the I. And it's only at the end of this of metaphysics that you can make that experience. And that's the reason why Heidegger was the first thinker or philosopher who had the idea of uh, thinking about the history of being, for example. And you can see that uh, being with the why, in as far as it is showing itself as being, as it is understood in metaphysics, is holding itself back as being with the why and remains hidden from metaphysics. And that's why Heidegger, among other things, is thinking about a new inception, first for philosophy and when he gives up the notion of philosophy for thinking. The thinking that will not, that will be different from the metaphysical kind of thinking that uh, was developed in the last two and a half thousand years. Uh, so, that would be my very short uh, take on this. Uh, Alberto is asking, uh, did Heidegger speak concretely about the influence of genetics and heritary in human life? Uh, and he says, I don't remember if in Solid Consumer he said something about it or even in the context of Leipzig Guide. Uh, Heidegger is not talking about genetics. Uh, I think genetics uh, was developed later. But in uh, Galassonite, for example, he refers... Uh, to the, the chemical foundation of, uh, of human life. And he, uh, he refers to a meeting that took place in, uh, what's the place called, in the Lake Constance, uh, Lindau. There was a meeting of Nobel Prize winners in Lindau and there they were talking about the possibility that in the not too distant future, scientists would be able to adapt human life in such a way that we would get the people we need. So he talks about the uh, very intelligent ones and the ones that are not so intelligent for the manual labor. And that this is an, uh, I think in that sense, he, he mentions it. And it is, of course, far more uh, developed in, in our time than it was in the 1950s. But it's something that is taken off uh, completely. Of course, now we have the DNA, uh, understanding of DNA as well. And it's, uh, so there's, I don't think there's anything concrete by Heidegger on genetics, but it's also the, it's, he has foreseen a lot of things that have become much more clear to us uh, over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, same with, uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and robots. Uh, not so long ago, I think uh, Elon Musk was presenting his uh, human-like uh, robot as uh, some, basically a piece of equipment that you can use to make your life easier and more comfortable. But at the same time, you wonder why would you need a robot to, to do your cook cooking or to do the hoovering in your house. But, Maybe people would like to do that. It's not really my cup of tea, but we'll see how, how far that goes. And uh, this morning I read uh, that for the first time they've planted human brain cells in the, in a pig. It's also a strange kind of experiments, but I think that the, the, the idea is to start growing human organs in other animals. So we can replace them. If your kidney goes bust, you can get a new kidney that was grown out of a pig. Uh, but it's a whole di different discussion, so I will not get into it here. But we'll come across it at some point in one of the webinars, I think. Uh, then Francisco Parra is asking me, what's the story of, of the relationship uh, between Heidegger and Meta Boss? What do you think about Dasein analysis as an alternative to psychoanalysis? Well, 
the story between the relationship in Heidegger and Boss is that uh, Boss uh, read Being in Time, and he was struck uh, by Heidegger's understanding of uh, Fürsorge as a uh, way making, room making kind of care, which is the opposite of interventional care. And that inspired him to start rethinking uh, psychoanalysis. He was a trained psychoanalyst. Analyst. Uh, he probably uh, he knew Freud at least, and uh, he was also a psychiatrist and uh, in that sense a medical doctor. And he was uh, brave enough, you could say, to write a letter to Heidegger in which he explained that he was studying uh, being in time and that he found this passage so uh, remarkable and that led to an uh, exchange of letters and pretty soon, one or two years later, to the first visit of Boss to Heidegger in uh, in Tottenberg in the, at the cabin. And they remained in touch and uh, Boss came up with the idea of doing these Solicon seminars um, it started as a one-off thing. Uh, it was the thing place, I think, at the clinic where he was working. But it was to introduce Heidegger's completely new way of thinking in many ways, and this non as, a, as an alternative to the, to the natural scientific thinking that was dominating uh, and is still dominating basically all uh, all science. Uh, or to give psychiatrists, psychotherapists, psychologists, a, a chance to, to meet Heidegger and listen to him and learn from him that there was maybe another way of thinking. And that this, uh, especially also this approach where you, first of all, see human beings as uh, existing as Dasein and not so much as a kind of subject that is uh, you don't look at the ment what, we, what we call mental illness as a as a medical problem, but as a limitation of freedom. And you can try to make to open up a way for the the person who has experienced this limitation of freedom to help him or her to re retrieve their free use of the possibilities. So I think it's a uh, It's an alternative to psychoanalysis, and at the same time, it's very different from uh, psychoanalysis in its theoretical foundation. Or psychoanalysis is still grounded in uh, natural science, you could say, and Dasein analysis is uh, as a different uh, starting point. It starts from Dasein and is trying to uh, open up. Uh, basically a free space so the client at the one hand feels free to say anything and doesn't hold back which is similar to the practice of uh, psychoanalysis of course but there is no there's no understanding of psycho uh, pathology so you don't look at people as people who have a mental illness so you're not trying to cure a mental illness like you would cure or try to cure a heart problem or kidney disease and things like that I hope that uh, serves this for now. Uh, let's see if there's anybody else who has a question. Let's, I can still keep up with the questions at least. So. If you... Uh, psychotherapy is still uh, based on the medical understanding of... Uh, of mental illness. So that's one of the reasons that they can use uh, medication. So the psycho and the down science analysis has no, uh, doesn't use medication. Uh, well, you keys, a uh, night is metaphor, actuality, or both. Uh, well, it's a uh, Maybe it's both, <laughs> we'll find out. But it's also about the night as a real experience, but it can take on different meanings or more complex meanings uh, when someone like Trakel is writing about it. But we'll see, I think. Um, 
myself, I'm often uh, fascinated by uh, by Trago's poetry. It's very uh, peculiar in many ways. And of course, he was uh, working in uh, military hospitals, so he got to see a lot of the, the horrors uh, of the First World War in person. And that's uh, it's something that uh, led to his uh, suicide in the end. He couldn't take it anymore. All these people with uh, limbs uh, blown away, uh, uh, eyes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Started taking uh, cocaine to ease the pain, but wasn't the smartest move, probably. Interesting is maybe also that uh, Ludwig von Fieker, who was the editor of the FACO uh, avant garde journal in uh, Vienna, knew uh, Trago personally and helped him and published also his uh, poetry. And he later met Heidegger in person as well. So Heidegger had direct uh, information about Trago from someone uh, who knew him quite well. And later he also uh, he visited uh, Trago's grave in, in Innsbruck and things like that and met with uh, von Fieker. Uh, can you talk about the trilogy? That's a question uh, Louise. So can you talk about the trilogy of Beiträge, Besinnung, Das Ereignis? How does his thought develop through these? Well, that's a, that's a nice question. <laughs> uh, let me see. I think uh, maybe the, a way to understand it, of course, the problem with Heidegger is, and that's something I didn't realize myself uh, for quite some time, we always tend to think of a devel a development of a, the thought of a philosopher as something that is a one-way street. And uh, so you do one thing after the other. Uh, you could say Kant was first developing his um, pre-critical uh, philosophy and writings based basically on the school of uh, Wolf and Baumgarten. And when he had this enlightening uh, moment uh, reading Hume, whose work was uh, luckily published uh, in German translation at the time, otherwise Kant would have written the Critique of Pure Reason. It's as simple as that. Uh, he starts writing uh, first a Critique of Pure Reason, then there's a Critique of Practical Reason, and then there's a, a Critique of, uh, what's it called in English? The Power of Judgment or something like that, Critique of Utaskraft. And Within Heidegger, he, he's always working on at least two, three, four, maybe three or four different paths of thinking at the same time. So if you use this metaphor of Heidegger thinking as a path of thinking that Otto Puckler used as the title of his famous uh, book on Heidegger, the Denkweg Martin Heidegger, then you get the impression that there is one, one way, one way, one road, one path. But this, this one path is basically is, uh, is a path of, of four different, or a way of four different passes that go on at the same time. And sometimes Heidegger on one pass will come into a, a hot track. So he, it will stop somewhere and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't know how to proceed it further. An example is being in time, of course, for Heidegger said, after publishing the first uh, third of the total project, he, uh, he never published anything else. Uh, so I think in the, when he's writing these manuscripts, these, these large manuscripts, there are of course more than uh, just these three in total, there are seven. So he's, the first thing he's doing in, in the bite way is trying to think beyond metaphysics and develop what he calls uh, being historical thinking, which is in a thinking that is very much aware of the fact that our thinking is concentrated on being with the I. And since his discovery that this being of the I is both the, the, is the unconcealment of being with the Y, and so far as being with the Y shows itself as being in this of metaphysics, and thus determines all the different fundamental metaphysical positions that Heidegger talks about, at the same time it's holding back. So it's a real movement of unconcealment. 
And if you want to bring out this non-metaphysical side, to put it simple, of, of being with the why, then you need another kind of thinking. And Arya's first attempt to develop this other kind of thinking is being historical thinking. He also calls it erdenken. It's a kind of creative thinking, not a conceptualizing thinking. And I think in the Besinung is a different way of further further thinking this uh, this other kind of thinking and develop it, uh, developing it further. So in that sense, is a development from being historical thinking towards Besinung as a, a new understanding of a non-metaphysical way of thinking. And then there's a, once you have developed this other kind of thinking, then you can re think what you were talking in, about in the Beiträge to Philosophy, the Contributions to Philosophy, which is a subtitle uh, from Ereignis, so on the event, then you can say, if I've come to this understanding of Besinum, I can try to write about Das Ereignis, the event, from in a different way than I did in the Beiträge. So in that sense, I think there's a development and a coherence to the three volumes. Well, Keith, uh, I will say if we can talk about the, 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 that question. Night is pain, pain, Schmetz is being. He's referring there, I think, to Ian, uh, Ian Moore, who might have said it. And uh, of course, there is something of pain in it. And it's also the, 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 the time of darkness. And there's no light. So, but it's a different experience. I'll talk about it in a bit. And there's a question by Michael in the end, privately, how did Heidegger feel about his lifetime efforts, both on a personal level and more generally? Was he optimistic about the future of his questioning after he would be gone? Uh, well, that's, that's an interesting question. And it's, it's, I think it's, it's a bit of both. Uh, there's a letter of Heidegger to uh, Kunda Neske, his editor one of his editors uh, who published, uh, among other things, uh, the two Nietzsche volumes and uh, On the Way to Language, from the Weg der Sprache. To Nietzsche, to Neske, he wrote that he would stop publishing in Germany because it d didn't make any sense. Nobody was taking his thinking seriously and uh, he was uh, talking to the wind, basically. And then a few years later, he took the decision to do a the Gesamtausgabe. So that seems to be a, a more optimistic uh, perspective, thinking, well, uh, you also find these remarks uh, throughout his life, basically, that uh, it may be another 50 or 100 years before people uh, will be in understanding what he was talking about. So I think he was pessimistic about the immediate future. And I think also because a lot of his great students were basically moving away from his paths of thinking and developing their own uh, philosophies. People like uh, Leuwit, uh, Kadamer, even Hannah Arendt, uh, Jonas, uh, you can name them all. So that was an experience he probably didn't like too much. There were very few people who would be willing to follow him on his whole complex path way of thinking that consists of several different paths at the same time. And that's something that today is still a problem, I think. Or people usually tend to to look for their favorite Heidegger. For some people, it's Heidegger up to being in time. So the early Freiburg lecture courses are very interesting and being in time is uh, very uh, interesting, maybe even a masterpiece. Maybe uh, go away. Uh, and other people are uh, are taking the later Heidegger and say, well, you have to, Richard Capobianco is an example of uh, people, someone like that, who's focusing solely on Heidegger's later work and says, well, here we have the true Heidegger. And that also avoids all the problems of Heidegger and national and socialism, because here he's, anyway, he's, he's not talking about that kind of political stuff. But I think it's to come to, well, you never come to a complete understanding of Heidegger's uh, thinking, I think, but to have a, a broad as possible in, uh, interpretation of the thinking 
you need to deal with this whole part of thinking, in my experience. And that's why I like to do both webinars on the early stuff of Heidegger uh, on his middle writings, like the contributions, uh, which we're doing now, and we'll be doing the event as well. And the later Heidegger, I think some of his uh, later essays uh, are amazing and deserve all the attention uh, we can give them. So it's both, uh, it's Heidegger's a little bit of both, it, I think. He's, in a sense, he's still optimistic yeah, about the future. Uh, in the famous saying of Hulderlin, uh, where the danger is, the saving power also grows. So. But there is danger. So uh, there's also the danger that the saving power will not be enough to to stop uh, the world falling apart. Um, I think today we uh, are pretty much aware of that uh, problem uh, with what's going on in the Ukraine and what may ha be happening uh, in the near future. Uh, and of course, all the problems with the environment and uh, climate change, etc. cetera. Um, in a sense, also the implosion of uh, politics that people have never had so little trust and faith in the politicians as uh, they do today. And that may be a danger for democracy. Um, well, that's, uh, let's say, my take on this uh, question. And then there's Francisco. He says, thanks a lot, Alfred. The night could be related, too, to that pre-reflexive area of life. Yes, of course. It's, uh, it's an experience. It's not... Uh, you cannot conceptualize it. So that's uh, but that we'll see in the when I do the little lecture. Anybody else uh, would like to uh, drop a penny? It, it doesn't have to be about Heidegger and his work. It can also be about. Uh, uh, the, the universal the academic background or things like that, or if you're looking for possibilities for some uh, things, uh, if you would like to do something, uh, one of the possibilities uh, we have is uh, offering you a stay in Neskirch at the, the famous slot. Uh, so you can stay there as a, as a fellow, either as a junior fellow, fellow or a senior fellow. And it basically means that you can stay for free. And there's a, a small, there's an apartment in the castle with three bedrooms, a uh, kitchen and a bathroom. And you can stay there for free and use all the materials in the archive and go to the Heidegger Museum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but you have to, to pay for your own uh, food and things. But you, of course, since you have a kitchen, uh, you can make it basically as expensive uh, as you like. So. If you're interested in something like that, you uh, let me know. Uh, Louise is another one. Uh, has there been much scholarship on the late black notebooks? Well, I think there are three, uh, maybe three remarks to be made about that. First one would be that uh, I would say that a lot has been written about the black, black notebooks. And interesting enough, uh, most of it was... Uh, in uh, uh, what's it called? In, well, in, in, in newspapers, that's the word. <laughs> Sometimes I can't <laughs> find the word I need. So that's where the whole debate started about the black notebooks, and then especially this whole uh, questioning of Heidegger being an anti Semite and uh, a true Nazi at heart, and things like that. And there have, of course, been uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, of conferences as well. It was a, the first one was a very big one in, in Paris where you had people like Sloterdijk, uh, uh, for example, who, who gave their opinions, and uh, Dieter Tomé and Nancy. Uh, then there were several in other places in Europe. And, there was one in Freiburg. I didn't attend it, but I know from people who were attending and who I 
believe are trustworthy in their what they're reporting is that there were quite a few people who were giving presentation about the black notebooks and admitted after the presentation that they never read them so uh, there's not much scholarship in that uh, I think uh, of course, the, the the whole focus has been on the the first uh, five volumes, the belegungen and anmerkungen, and uh, I mean, uh, well, the, the other ones they have passed by uh, basically unnoticed. So the the fichilier and the and things like that. I think there's still room. Uh, I think uh, scholarship is not, maybe not the right approach for them. But that's one of the questions that are still open to me is uh, well, what role or place do they have in the whole Gesamtausgabe? I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I also think that the, the first volumes that led to this whole storm of, uh, of anti-Heidegger sentiment, which is still uh, raging today, is uh, has a lot in it that people never talked about, and which is, in a sense, to me, more important than what he has to say in some of these uh, nasty remarks you could say about uh, Husserl, for example, and some anti-Semitic uh, sayings. But that's all different. Uh, Story, but I think that the later notebooks uh, both are waiting first for an uh, hermeneutic or the development of hermeneutics, how to read them and, and, and interpret them. What place do they have within the Gesamtaus Kaaba? How do they relate to the published work? How do they relate to, let's say, the for a long period also the, the lecture course that Heidegger was giving at the time and also to the these manuscripts we talked about, like uh, contributions and uh, Besinnung. So I think there, uh, there's a lot of, and of course, you, if you start working on these late notebooks, problem is of course that there is, a, there's no center for Heidegger research anymore in Germany. <laughs> so that would have been something that could have led to the same kind of uh, interesting work that has been done on the early Freiburg lecture courses when they were being published. There have been a lot of dissertations on them. There's still people writing dissertations about them today, but I think this later stuff, these notebooks, uh, we must hope that some people will start working on them. Uh, let's see, Michael, Michael is back again. Uh, I have to admit, I don't know, uh, there will be translation, uh, our translation of the remaining notebooks in the works, uh, so when will they be available? I think it, they may be in the works, uh, but we can also ask yourself uh, how much interest will there be uh, for this uh, for these late uh, notebooks uh, in the academic world. Uh, I hope they will be translated, uh, but I don't know uh, when they will be available. It often depends on the the idiot who's willing to do the all that work because it's, uh, it's an amazingly complex uh, job. And it pays uh, very little, mm. so it takes you years, I think, to to make a decent translation. But we'll see. Uh, fortunately, we still have the German ones. So if worse come to worse, we read hard in German. Uh, another question by Francisco. A general question: I see sometimes the paintings you post. Do you think there uh, is there an art closer to the unveiling of being or to the night? Um, I'm not uh, I'm here. Uh, there are, the unveiling of being is very difficult, I think. And might be the kind of art Heidegger was hoping for that might be developed. Uh, as you may remember, he was thinking of art as a, as a, maybe the saving power that is hidden within the essence of technology. 
plus if you go back uh, to the Greeks, uh, techne and art are closely related. So, and of course, the famous essay on the origin of the work of art, he's uh, saying that uh, art is uh, putting into the work of truth. And I think that's is a way of, of seeing a lot of uh, artwork, especially also uh, a painter like Van Gogh. Uh, but there are a lot of different ones you could uh, name. And of course, it's uh, they open up a world. They bring, uh, they, they show people. A simple example is uh, Van Gogh's uh, famous potato eaters. These were people that would never be painted uh, 100 years before. So art had to be related either to religion or to the very wealthy or the, the noble families. So this is all realistic or showing the life of people you know, who have lead miserable lives, you could say. is something that belongs to it. Also a very different kind of understanding of uh, feminine uh, beauty, for example. And in poetry, you would, maybe you could find it at it, the easiest way might be in poetry because in the, uh, you have maybe more more of a possibility to 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 to, to let's say uh, touch being maybe not in a physical sense but in the capture it it's also too too grasping but to point to it maybe. Is something as a dimension beyond our normal understanding of the world, and it's. Uh, I think that you we find it a little bit. I would say yeah, maybe in Heidegger's eyes in 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 Hölderlin when he's talking about uh, the holy as a dimension, which is. Uh, beyond the metaphysical dimension, but it's very complicated, I think. It's, uh, if I to imagine how a painting would look like, this is uh, showing a being with the, with the why. But it's... Uh, uh, Maybe there's a way of uh, Heidegger himself is playing with it, I think. Uh, and his many uh, these hints and uh, what they call his, uh, his poems. As I believe this, uh, uh, where you can find traces of it. Maybe if you're a poet, you can develop it. Uh, oh find a way of doing it uh, if you're interested by looking at those. Uh, Michael writes poetry, so he might have some poems about being with the, uh, with the wire up his sleeve. Uh, let's see, uh, the other one is, uh, does the non-verbal expressions have a kind of preference regarding the unveiling? Um, not necessarily so. I think that art is, uh, in all its different variations, uh, very, uh, very important to Heidegger. Uh, I think that the first real ex experience of art he had was when he was in uh, in Holland, of all places. He was visiting Amsterdam and he was giving uh, some lectures uh, in Amsterdam in The Hague, and in Amsterdam, uh, when he was there, the the remains, which was basically uh, almost the whole of the first exhibition of Van Gogh's works, was still there. And Heidegger visited uh, the museum where they were exhibited uh, twice and spent a long time looking at them. And that's uh, and that also you find in the the origin of the work of art is description of the famous shoes of Van Gogh, whether they belong to the female uh, uh, 
farmer or if they are in God's own shoes. But I think if you, that was, I think the, the, the first experience also, the, the famous cross of, over the wheat field against the threatening sky was Heidegger's first real experience of the power of, of art. And something similar happened after the Second World War when he was, uh, one of his friends uh, was a former student, Petzet, you also may know from his uh, book on Heidegger, this uh, kind of biography, reminiscent, reminiscing uh, about Heidegger, uh, who uh, got him, uh, uh, opened the doors to, to modern art, in, in especially uh, Baal. Um, Basel, where he uh, got to know some of the very famous uh, galleries, and they had uh, books of uh, Paul Klee, and that's where Heidegger learned about, uh, let's say, the modern painting as well. And it's uh, there, are of course, these notes of uh, Heidegger on uh, Paul Klee, which he himself. Uh, has forbidden to be published. So they exist, I have them, but <laughs> you're not supposed to, to publish them. But uh, maybe the, the Clay might be somebody who's for Heidegger, a kind of a post metaphysical um, artist. And that's something we can delve into uh, at some point. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, Louise is mentioning the, the soup <laughs> thrown over Van Gogh's sunflowers by uh, climate change protesters to women. I think they had a glass uh, covering over the painting, so it can't have hurt the painting too much. And they were saying, well, it's a painting with more than human lives when people are living uh, in poverty, basically, in countries like uh, England and uh, France, Germany. Mm. Well, that's some, something you can discuss, but I don't think that uh, keeping, uh, preserving works of art is, uh, is the reason why some people live in poverty. There are other reasons which are more important, I think. Uh, then we have, uh, Boss said Heidegger was the most slandered man he had ever encountered, and Heidegger was inca incapable of defending himself. What did Heidegger think deep down about these attacks and his reputation? Uh, I think uh, there is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, things to say about that as well. I'm not so sure that Heidegger was not capable of uh, defending himself. Uh, he could be pretty uh, harsh and. Uh, uncompromising and even uh, very uh, to the limit in his own critique of other uh, philosophers. Uh, one of, I think, I think that the, 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 there are two ways of looking at it basically. On the one hand, Heidegger said, well, the things they are accusing me of, it's nonsense. And if you study my work and you read it, then you can see that I'm not a, a Nazi philosopher, probably. And so he, he refused basically to get engaged. A lot of people were pressing him to, to do, uh, to, to set, talk about his uh, years as rector of the Freiburg University and his relation to national socialism and, and put the cards on the table, you could say. Um, it's not just uh, Neske was one of the people, uh, Bultmann, so a lot of people were pushing him to go in that direction, but he didn't want to do it. And you also can think of a, about this understanding of language. If keeping silent belongs to the essence of language, then you can say a lot by keeping silent. So I think some of the... I think the things that, that may have heard him are the ones, the, the to totally false rumors that people came up with. Um, so I think he, he was bigger, man big enough uh, 
person to 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 deal with it. Uh, but it was, and he would have, probably would have made his life easier if you had come out like other professors uh, saying, "Well, I was a fan for a little bit, uh, for a little time of Hitler, and so he would do bring good things to Germany." But after a couple of years, I realized my mistake, and everything else uh, was a horror story, which it was, of course. Uh, so, sorry, folks, I made a mistake, and. Uh, that's it. That's... Heidegger never denied that it was also a part of his path of thinking, basically, this uh, involvement with National Socialism. But that's a very complex uh, topic. Next week, I'll do another webinar on, on the whole problem. So if you're interested, you can still join there. Uh, let's see, there's a lot of questions floating around at the moment. Uh... Uh, do you know on which uh, artists of his time Heidegger made r remarks and what were they? Well, if... he made uh, about a lot of artists of his time. He made remarks. Uh, you can find some of them in his uh, published writings. He, he knew a lot of, uh, interesting enough, he, he knew most German sculptors, the really important ones he knew personally. He was much more, uh, he, he met Schorz Brock as well in uh, uh, Field uh, in Normandy, and he also became friends with an HR in Le Tour. So, uh, and of course, with uh, Tida, he did this uh, little book, uh, Art and Space, where they worked together on it. And another person uh, you can name is uh, people like Bernard Heiliger, German sculptor Hans Koch. And there's a correspondence between Heiliger and Hans Koch where they talk about sculpting and the relation of philosophy and art and things like that. Uh, Koch was really interested in Heidegger's uh, thinking as well, and uh, they discussed uh, these things. Uh, there's a, there is a, the marvelous, there's a marvelous drawing of uh, Chili Da, of Heidegger's hands, which is in the possession of the Heidegger family, which is, uh, is really impressive. Uh, it would be nice to bring all that, uh, all the portraits of Heidegger that have been done by seven, eight uh, famous sculptors There's together in one place. You also have uh, Dix and Wiemer and people like that. So, uh, Heidegger, and of course, the, in, in what is still will be remaining in Marbach, uh, where his uh, literary state is kept after the full publication of the Gesamtausgabe and even the additional volumes they're planning. There will be uh, tens of thousands of uh, of notes by Heidegger, and there's for sure there will be also notes on uh, painters. And uh, there's very little by Heidegger on music. I think he never got a feeling uh, for for music, so it's something to think about. Very different from Nietzsche in that respect. Uh, this Van Gogh is a question by Keys. Paint what Heidegger is saying. Well. I don't think that Van Gogh is painting what Heidegger is saying, because Van Gogh had no idea what Heidegger was saying. But I think it's the the notion of this, uh, the, the art opens up a world, is something he got from his experience at the Van Gogh exhibition in Amsterdam. And if you look at the, the, the short section, basically it does on these uh, shoes in uh, the origin of the work of art, they are basically... Uh, presupposing the whole of Van Gogh's uh, work, I think. Uh, in that sense, it's, uh, it also gave him the confidence to, to write about art. And that's something people also tend to forget that, uh, that this, the university system was very different than uh, today. If you were a professor of philosophy to start writing about uh, art, could get you into trouble with the people working in the uh, in the Department of Art, so, of the History of Art. So it's, uh, then we have, uh, let's see. Uh, I think it's not so interesting in, uh, it's not a question by Keith on how Van Gogh paints. It's, it's this world that's opening up in these paintings is what is grasping him and he's not so much interested in the technique that Van Gogh used and this very uh, incredibly fast way of, of working. 
uh, uh, so it's he's not interested in that part of it it's art is this liberating experience in many ways for this showing us a, a different uh, world or uh, opening a different perspective of the world we live in uh, oh I, I might do uh, uh, is there anything allowed to share about the clay related thoughts well maybe next year I will do a, a webinar on it a short one maybe a weekend one but I will need to translate the uh, remarks into uh into english and i still have to figure out a couple of words that i didn't figure out so far it's not and there are not many but if i could get the whole thing uh, transcribed into uh, then it would be good and then we can uh, discuss them uh, does aesthetics get over it's not a question by keys does aesthetics get overcome with metaphysics uh, i don't think so i think aesthetics belongs to metaphysics it's a metaphysical understanding of art. And I don't think that art itself has been overcome. Uh, that's the uh, Hegelian position, basically, for Heidegger. Uh, there's a time where he's being more skeptical about uh, the possibilities of art, but I think, uh, especially in his later way of understanding of art, it's so for, to me, it's pretty clear that he still sees that art has this, uh, maybe a, 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 has the possibility of showing uh, something non-metaphysical. And then you can, of course, think of uh, the poetry of Hilderlin, uh, of but also of uh, pre-Platonic uh, thinkers. Uh, Andrea is asking, isn't the Heideggerianism, the Socratism of our time? Uh, I'm not 100% sure I understand what you mean by it. So. I think if, the, for me, the, the, the thing that uh, brings uh, Heidegger and Socrates together is this in never ending uh, questioning. Heidegger is, uh, it's, and that's one of the problems of Heidegger thinking, and that's why it's very hard to, to grasp Heidegger's meaning in an academic setting. He's, he's always questioning himself. When he has written Being in Time, he's trying to pull the chair from under him, and he succeeds in doing it and gives up the, the, the project of Being in Time uh, as a book. He still keeps working on the question of being in time, you could say, but it's uh, so. And I think that's one of the things you can learn from Heidegger, like you can learn it from Socrates, is this uh, questioning to, 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 to pose questions all the time. So it's uh, if that helps, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of it's an answer. Uh, well, yeah, I know this uh, the letter that Miles is referring to. This was a letter to uh, Leslie Faber by Boss when Heidegger was being considered uh, to invite him to the US. And Boss himself uh, claims that he uh, did research into Heidegger's political past. And otherwise, if he had found uh, incriminating evidence, he would not have befriended Heidegger. Interesting enough, there's also uh, a friendly exchange of uh, letters between uh, Heidegger and Viktor Frankl, which will be publishing uh, in the Heidegger Jahrbuch. And Frankl, of course, was a survivor of Auschwitz. And he met Heidegger when Heidegger was invited to, to Vienna to give the, the lecture, I think it was uh, Das Ding, this thing, at the, the theater of uh, Vienna. So it was probably 1,500, 2,000 people. And they met privately also after the after the lecture, and they, they visited each other a couple of times. And uh, the letters are very friendly between them. Uh, 
Uh, then there's another question about Boston Heidegger again. Uh, when they were meeting, uh, let's say when Heidegger started doing, doing the Tzolikon seminars, I think they started in 1956, if I have to say by heart. Or maybe 1959. Well, Heidegger stopped. This, uh, he resumed his teaching when he was uh, became a professor emeritus in 1951, and then he did these uh, two lecture courses. Basically, the first one was uh, what is called thinking, was I think, uh, two semesters, the winter semester 51, 52, and then the summer semester 52, and then he did uh, the Satz von Bund, the principles ground, and that was his last lecture course at the university so he was uh, moving away from the academic uh, circle in many ways and it's also when he starts giving these uh, lectures to uh, uh, to another audience made up of uh, basically bourgeois people moving, who were gathering at ba in Baden-Beiler or in, uh, in Bremen or in, uh, in Munich so, uh, well, the, at the end, there, there were some problems between Boss and Heidegger. Uh, it's, uh, as far as I know, there was a, there's about a page in uh, the, the, the Grundriss by uh, Boss, which Heidegger claimed was uh, basically his own uh, text. And Boss didn't indicate uh, in the book that it was uh, Heidegger speaking, so to say. And then he said, well, you can understand that I will uh, stop with our collaboration. But in view of our friendship, I will not uh, go public with the matter. And that's when the, basically the, they never met again after that. And the correspondence ends with it. I don't. Do the notes on Paul Clay have an interpretation of the painting Bunda Blitz? Uh, no. I don't think so. No, there's no... Uh, and it's... The notes are very short. It's all... Uh, sometimes it's just... A, so the kind of key uh, words that he's uh, putting one after the other. So... Oh. Uh, where are you? <laughs> there you are. Any uh, anything else at the moment? But all these these topics are uh, basically endless. Um, that's one of the things people forget. For example, is with uh, Art and Space that the original publication of the book in one hundred fifty uh, copies contained uh, the lit uh, the litos that uh, she did I made her for so and that's something that uh, if you now read it in the Kazantas copy you don't realize that these uh, that it was a joint uh, project it's the only time that Heidegger worked with somebody else on an uh, <sighs> on a book the definition of relationality. Uh, I don't think you can give a definition of relationality. I think I would be interested in knowing what the, the, the German original is uh, before answering the question. The different ways of relating. Well, that's. Uh, Chili da. Yeah. Um, I can't say too much about it, I must admit. Uh, there are some, uh, there's a document or an interview uh, where Chili da talks about this relation with Heidegger. Uh, I would have to look it up there. And then the there must have been letters between them, but I've never seen them so far. Uh, but be bit so. It's still also within, uh, something to uh, 
that somebody could look into and follow further. I think Miles is interested in it as well. Uh, there may be letters uh, of Heidegger to Chilida in his uh, literary estate. There might even be uh, a couple of books that, uh, that Heidegger dedicated to him. Uh, maybe there are books where there are uh, notes and uh, of Chilida uh, on Heidegger. He said he studied Heidegger's uh, work, so must be there may be traces. It's the same with uh, Rene Char. He also read Heidegger, and even uh, of course Paul Salam. There are copies of uh, dedica dedicated copies uh, between them. Uh, Heidegger was a fan of Taiwan, and it's interesting that he never, as far as I know, uh, had anything to say about him. He never did a, a seminar on uh, Ceylon or, or a lecture. And though he himself claimed that he had read everything uh, that uh, Ceylon had, had published. And that's also a very uh, <laughs> complex topic that you could spend a lot of time on. Uh, well, let's see if there are no more questions, then uh, uh well, the, 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 the Uh, it's being quoted, this statement about Ceylon, uh, by uh, Fai, of all people, who translates uh, the German, Ich kenne alles von ihm, as uh, I know everything about him. So he's totally misinterpreting what Heidegger is saying. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it may, it may be uh, that Baumann uh, who organized the visit of uh, Ceylon to Freiburg, where Heidegger met him for the first time. And then, of course, they decided to meet at uh, the cabin in Tautner Berg, uh, where you get the famous uh, poem at Tautner Berg uh, of Ceylon. It's in that context. So if you look up uh, Baumann, I think it's called Erinnerung uh, an Paul Ceylon or something like that. Uh, if you want, if you drop me an email, I can look it up for you okay. and tell you. Uh, with Rene Char, there is, uh, that's still uh, waiting for somebody to explore. Uh, you would have to look at the correspondence and uh, try to uh, dig up his, uh, these copies <laughs> of the books that Heidegger sent to Rene Char. But these were really... Uh, Interesting, uh, these are interesting connections, especially if you're interested in art as well. Uh, Heidegger had relations with pretty famous and great uh, artists of his time. Yeah, the, as Michael's pointing out, there are several books on Heidegger's relationship with Ceylon. So I think if you want to go back to the, the basics, most of it is uh, reported by Baumann that people then later also inter interpret in their own ways. The correspondence has not been published. Uh, same with uh, Rene Char. It's, uh, you have to dig them up somewhere. I've, uh, a lot of that stuff I do have somewhere, <laughs> but I still need to do transcriptions uh, with uh, quite a few of them. And that makes the reading a bit easier than when you do it in the handwriting, although can uh, it's possible to do it. That's one of the reasons I did this uh, webinar on how to read Heidegger's handwriting, where we looked at the manuscript of uh, uh, what's it, the Gera. So, the, which is one of the four uh, lectures Heidegger gave in uh, Bremen in 1949, and. Could do a, sim a webinar maybe next year on the, you know, of, of some of these small correspondences and uh, 
uh, do a transcription of the, the letters and uh, maybe also translation them into English. So that's a possibility. <laughs> Might be interesting to try that once. So if anybody would like to experiment a little bit with that kind of thing, let me know and uh, see if I can put something together. Yes, there are a lot of But you can uh, going to Totna Berg uh, is also an interesting experience in visiting uh, the cabin uh, and knowing who, how many people were there <laughs> visiting either. So, Um, I don't know um, if anybody wants to get in touch with anybody else who's uh, responding in the tweet in, in the chat. Um, you can send me an email. Um, if I know the the other person, I can um, put you in touch. And it's one of the the things uh, that I will try to uh, to do. Uh, it's part of the, the whole setup of the live streaming, which always starts later than I intend to, because I'm always struggling with the right buttons, but somehow we get to it anyway. Um, oh, I'll have to dig up some stuff and we, uh, I'll do something uh, with the letters next year. Let's see uh, what it brings. And they're unpublished, uh, unread, most of the, some of them. So you'd be the first to read them after uh, the person they were addressed to read them. Okay. If we're done with the questions, uh, I have a text. It's it's fourteen pages, but I'll. Uh, Uh, I can get to it if uh, everybody is agreeable to the idea, then uh, we have 45 minutes, so that will leave some time for some questions after. So, uh, make sure. I see no protests, so then I'll proceed in this way. I called it Martin Heidegger in the night. Um, as I said, it's basically a two-part uh, story. The first part is on Heidegger and Boron, and the second part is on Heidegger and Trago. So, the Benedictine Archabbey of Boron, consecrated to Saint Martin, of course, uh, patron saint also that gave Martin his name, quickly grew into a spiritual and artistic center after it was founded in 1863. Heidegger's ancestors on his father's side came from the Upper Danube Valley, where Andreas, the son of Hans Konrad Heidegger and Katharina Karp, was born on November 28, 1700, in the Donauer Schafhaus, which is a stable for sheep. And attached to it was a a farm uh, house, so it is, it's basically a small farm uh, where they were not uh, dealing with cows, but they were doing, uh, they had sheep. Um, and this this property was in the immediate vicinity of the Archabbey of Boron. Um, Heidegg himself mentioned this relationship in a lecture. And it's quoted by uh, Otto Buckler, and we'll read it. Perhaps Hölderlin, the poet, must become the determining destiny of the confrontation for a thinker whose grandfather was born in Overly, so in this farmhouse, around the same time that the Easter hymn and their poem Remembrance, Andenke, were written, which lies under the rocks in the upper Donaby Valley near the bank of the river. And for those who don't know, the boy one is about 15 kilometers or 10 miles from uh, Meskish.
and the Easter is the, the name for this part of the Danube River. So it's basically about the Danube River, the Easter hymn. As a five-year-old boy, little Martin made his first pilgrimage to Boron with his mother. Here he got to know the liturgy that was so decisive for the Arts Abbey. As a boy, pupil of the Constance Gymnasium, and later as a student, he was shaped by the mysterious religious atmosphere. Father Fercade, who was one of the, the brothers or the monks, at the, was also the, the monk who received the guests and, and the painter, describes Boron's religious atmosphere as follows. I quote him, where ever day after day, with the exception of the short hours of the night, prayers rise to heaven, not only from the monks, but also from numerous pilgrims. God's mercy also descends and with her rest and peace. Even those who inwardly feel strongly opposed to Catholicism or even scold themselves against unbelievers are seized by the religious atmosphere of Boron. Any visit to the Abbey, Kate, taught me about this. And the regular participation of many people of different faiths in our service, especially in the evenings, is undoubtedly partly due to this mysterious influence. So now we're getting a little bit closer to the night. When he was a private lecturer from 1915 until 1923, Heidegger was in Meskirch almost every year and used the semester break to prepare his lectures and seminars. The cabin in Tonaberg was built in uh, 1922 in the first time Heidegger stayed at the cabin was August 1922. And the cabin, of course, is this year uh, has already celebrated its 100 years of existence. Since he dealt intensively with mysticism, the terminology of religion, Augustine and early Christianity during these years. The library in Boron will have been an important working tool. Now, the, the library of Boron is uh, very large. They have 400,000 uh, books or they had an, already in the time that Heidegger was going there. So we stayed in Boron for a few days with his friend Theophil Reis in August 1920. 1920 and got books on loan from the library for his philosophical work in Mesquite. During this time, he also became friends with Father Fakada, who we mentioned before, and Archabbot Dr. Rafael Walser. We find first evidence of Heidegger's participation in the church service in Boron in his lecture course, Basic Problems of Phenomenology from the Winter Semester 1919-20. In the context of the question of the outgrowth of science from the factual life world, he gives three examples of the way in which sciences lift certain subject areas out of factual life experience. I quote Heidegger here, a flower strewn meadow that we walk along on a May hike. This excerpt from direct life experiences in the expressive context of botanical scientific treatises on these plants, or the Rembrandt Hall in Berlin's Kaiser Friedrich Museum, encountering its wealth in an hour of pure artistic enjoyment. And the same excerpt from life events in the art historical monograph on Rembrandt, or a simple choral mass in the Benedictine liturgy in the Boron Abbey and the theological scientific treatise on the sacrifice of the mass. So science objectifies, but we experience in factual life experience. It creates a distance between the observing subject and the object experienced in the experience, and thus removes the immediacy of the life encounter. In the life experience, there is still no difference between what is experiencing and what is being experienced. Another quote from Heidegger. Let us visualize the three concrete examples, the same lecture course, three, a choral mass that we attend and a theological dogmatic treatise on it. In the respective above it is announced that something from the non-scientifically manifested life world will also be included in the scientific context of expressions. However, this identical something is both in a different relation to the self-world and its situation. We merely state, factually, I feel differently in the non-scientific declared life world than in the same newly expressed context of proclamation science. Right. The mathematical and theological knowledge of God as the highest principle of being and knowledge is completely different from the pious way in which believers have and know about God. This also means that we should only deal scientifically or philosophically 
with those parts of reality that we know from our pre-scientific world. During his stays in Boyron, Heidegger took part in the life of the monks and also followed the strenuous rhythm of life. In a clear letter he wrote to his wife, Elfriede, since Friday, I've been here in my old cell and have got used to the closed and restrained life of the monks. I would also like to have the monks robe right away because I always find it contrary to style when I go in civilian clothes through the cloister corridors, end of quote. It was precisely the strict agenda that allowed him to find the right mood for his work, the right mood for the... In July 1929, Elisabeth Blochmann was a long-time guest in Freiburg and at the cabin in Tautnerberg. She also went on a trip to Boron with Heidegger. They spent the whole day there discussing religious and theological issues. We find a trace of these conversations in Heidegger's letter to Blochmann of September 12, 1929. So it's after the publication of Being in Time. And he writes there, because the truth of our existence is not an easy thing. Corresponding to it, inner truthfulness has its own depth and diversity. It does not consist solely in the settling of rational considerations. It needs its day and the hour in which we have existence as a whole. Then we learn that in all its essentials, our hearts must remain open to grace. God, or whatever you call it, calls everyone in a different voice. We are not allowed to stick to the brittle made up that today's people come up with, but have to worship the power and solidity of the great in history. The path of human existence on a large scale is not nothing, but what we return to again and again when we have grown in depth. But this return is not a takeover of what has been, but a transformation. End of quote. And of course, this takeover or transformation is what I call Wiederholung, retrieval in being in uh, time. In these sentences, Heidegger alludes to three important topics which keep coming to light upon his path of thinking. First, Dasein exists mostly and initially inauthentically, uneigentlich. Authentic existence is only given to us at rare moments. For Heidegger, the moment means the resolute being held out in resoluteness, so that we encounter the special possibilities and circumstances of the situation. The moment opens up our situation and at once with it, our original being towards death. Two, these are moments of grace. In Heidegger's understanding of religion, the moment of divine grace is of decisive importance from the beginning. Devotion to God, and not autonomous act of the subject, is decisive for the religious experience. Without grace, no one comes to true faith. The way to God then remains closed to him or her. The religious experience must be led back into the inner unity of life, that is, feeling. Only in feeling can we really be approached by God. The religious feeling, the feeling of dependence on God, should determine all our actions. Religion is worship, that is, binding oneself to God by serving him. Heidegger will later speak of the mysterious moment of the undivided unity of intuition and feeling, one being, nothing without the other. Three. The growing in depth refers to the concept of earthliness, Unständigkeit, which is central to Heidegger thinking. Earthly is that which is grounded, that which is good for something. Earthliness is a phenomenon that can be demonstrated in factic life experience. Of course, it also has to do with being at home. I'm out. As a historically existing being, man has a relationship to his past, which he should make his own. What is interesting here is that the Benedictines have the stabilitas loci, or loci. That is, they remain tied to the mother house and spend their lives there. You can be transferred to somewhere else for a certain period of time. For example, Father, Examp Father Ficardo who lived for a long time in Munich, Vienna and Palestine because of his artistic training and work. But in the end, you will come back home. Stabilitas loci means stability of the place, or in other words, 
Rusliness. Heidegger and Blochmann attended the high mass in the morning and Compline in the evening. As Heidegger's letter of September 12, 1929 shows, the two liturgies had different effects on his liberal Protestant friend, also half Jewish. Both Heidegger again from this letter. That already shows us your position on the Compline, which had to give you more than high mass. The fact that man walks into the night every day is at most a banality for the because he usually makes it a day, as he understands the day, as a continu continuation of a business and a tumult. In the compline, there is still the mythical and metaphysical element force, elemental force of the night, which we must constantly break through in order to truly exist. Because the good is only the good of the bad. Today's people are proficient in organizing everything and everyone, but they are no longer able to collect themselves for the night. We seem to be and achieve something in the movement, but where there is rest and leisure, we no longer know what to do with ourselves. So for, the, for you, the compline has become a symbol of the fact that existence is held into the night and the inner necessity of daily readiness for it. We are fundamentally misguided in our search by the prevailing activity and its successes and results. We think the essentials are to be manufactured and forget that it only grows when we are completely and in the face of night and evil. Life according to our heart, live according to our heart. This primordial negative is decisive. Do not put anything in the way of the depth of existence. Standard quote. The important difference between high mass and compline is that during high mass, the priest consecrates bread and water mixed with water as overings so that they may be transformed into the flesh and blood of Christ. For a Protestant like Blochmann, the waver can only have symbolic value. She remains an outsider during this church celebration. Compline, on the other hand, allows us to find the right collection for the mythical, mystical and metaphysical elemental force of the night. Because at night, the visible, that is, the beings as a whole, disappears into the dark, into the dark and so in nothingness. Dasein is brought before the possibility of its authentic existence and can experience being itself. Only at night do the invisible things become visible and existence can grow into its depths, that is, become earthly. Day is the period between the rising of the sun and its setting, and therefore the time in which the person has to be active, because only then is the light and bonds. The alternation of day and night should also determine the, p the pace of life of people and the order of the day. But modern man has cancelled the difference and is ceaselessly active for fear of boredom. He is constantly chasing the illusion of the latest and turning night into day. With that, he also loses the time for meditative thinking, or in German, Besinu. Heidegger also connects the night with evil. Both are understood here metaphysically or fundamentally ontologically. The ethical dimension of these phenomena is excluded here. Evil is part of good as night is part of day. In Benedictine spirituality, noon is considered to be the time when Christ hung on the cross, evening the hour of his death, and morning that of his resurrection. The night is the time of distance from God, and thus at the same time, the time of the greatest danger and deepest fear as the time of the as well as the time of the greatest hope. But where there is danger to quote Hildevin, what can save also grows. For the believer, night is the time during which Christ overcomes death. Since there can be no redemption without death, there must be night, and it is literally the evil of the good. Therefore, the believer understands his existence as being held into the night and needs the right inner concentration in order to survive this being exposed to the night. This concrete and early Christian life experience is formalized by Heidegger and explained in its existential meaning. 
The same motives return in the Slater interpretation of Ugolin. In this lecture, he describes the poet as someone who has been thrown out into the between, between the gods and man, into the night of the gods that fled. So that's the, the first part. Well, uh, now we get to uh, some poetry by Trago, and now, uh, now we can still uh, do some uh, question and answer. So this is the second part of Sardegan Trago. In a small cabin book, out of Erfahrung des Denkens, translated as the thinker as poet, which I think is a pretty useless translation, we find a hint relevant to our subject on page 85. Heidegger first describes the moor. He says, when the evening light, slanting into the wood somewhere, bosses the tree trunks in cold. It is evening, because the evening light, the moonlight falling in the forest, bosses its trunks cold. Where does the evening light fall? Somewhere in the forest, that is, in the clearing. The evening light shines into the clearing in the forest and bases its trunks in gold. Unconcealment occurs. The evening light, the moonlight, can only shine into the clearing in winter. Which is why Heidegger must have been in this mood on a winter evening. In other words, this position was in this mood and the following thoughts came to him in this mood. These are stimmen. And then he writes on the right side. Thinking and thinking are the stamps neighbor to poetry. They grow out of being and reach into its truth. Their relationship makes us think of what Hölderlin sings of the trees of the woods. To each other, they remain unknown so long as they stand the neighboring trunks. At a time when all living languages are constantly dying off and the visual power of the new media exceeds any hearing of the unspoken, the attempt to discuss poetic language seems to be an outdated and hopeless undertaking. What else could poetry say to us, the people of today? How useful could it be to think about poetry? There are definitely more important life-related tasks to be solved. Ecological catastrophes, terrorism, nuclear arms race, the Ukrainian war, political radicalization are the issues that every serious thinker should grapple with. Why poetry? Why poet? Why thinker? The poet thinks. In his poetry, he corresponds to language. and spricht er der Sprache. The poet is the listener. He listens to what is spoken to him and evokes it in his poetry. It is only when beings are called into the world that they are and can show themselves to men in their unconcealedness. The being of beings is meaning. The poet creates meaning and thus opens up the meaningful world in which man has always been at home and which he keeps losing. Poetry is not a particular way of speaking. It is the essence of human language. Our everyday language is a poor, limited language that has lost its poetry. The thinker ponders. He listens to what the poet has sung and makes sense of it. The poet opens the human world in its diverse and inscrutable structures. The thinker reflects on these structures and tries to determine the essence of man. Just as every thinker thinks only one thought, According to Heidegger, every poet composes only one poem. The thinker thinks his only thought, expressing it in a variety of works, and yet this one thought remains unspoken in the work. His one and only thought enables the work, its structure and systematics. The real dialogue with the thinker's thought is only the thinking one, the thinking conversation of the thinkers, which we call the history of philosophy. The poet composes only from a poem. 
that is, the poem, remains unspoken. None of the individual poems, not even their total, says everything. The actual poem remains unspoken. The poetic dialogue can be the poetic conversation of poets. In his poetry, Trakel responds to Hölderlin, Rimbaud and other poets. The dialogue of thinking with poetry is necessary because the meaning of being is only thung in poetry. Without the meaningful world that has always been revealed in poetry, there would be nothing to think about. Since, like Minerva's owl, she only begins her flight at dusk, that is, when the evening light falls somewhere in the forest and bounces its trunks in gold, philosophy can only ponder. The conversation of thinking with poetry is dangerous and requires careful restraint. It's all too easy for thinking to disrupt and silence the singing of the poem. Listening to poetry while thinking is becoming thoughtful. And only in this contemplative reflection, Besinum, can thinking evoke the essence of language. That we experience again what it means to dwell in language. Night song. Now we get to travel. One of Travel's poems, The Night of the Poor, says, It is, it's twilight. The poet calls the night near. He tells it to come. His singing brings the night closer without tearing it from the distance. The presentness in which the poet calls the night is not that of the present. It does not now and here become night. The presentness of the cold is different and much deeper. Only his cold tells us what the night is. It's twilight. The first in which this phrase belongs continues. And dull, or pounding the night at our door. A child whispers, how are you shaking so much? The deeper do we lean, the poor to each other and keep silent. Keep silent as if we were no more. And uh, suddenly the night bangs on our door. Twilight announces the coming of the night. And the night is the time of darkness. The night can be terrible because it blinds us and in it everything that exists sinks into nothingness. Fear overtakes us and leaves us trembling. It is a basic condition of human existence and opens up human life in its uncanniness. In fear, men find himself in nothing and nowhere. His being in the world as such and his being with others disappear in anxiety, so that in his isolation he's confronted with the finitude of his own existence. Man becomes mortal and knows of death. In anxiety, everything becomes dark and all speech falls silent. The child whispers because it, in its innocence, it's not yet afraid. But twilight comes again because even the longest night passes. Morning dawns at the end of the night and visit the day rises again. Argos' poetry thrives on the ambiguity of language. His sentences are not statements. They call beings into unconcealment. The night is terrible, but this does not mean that it is pure darkness, since it also makes one contemplative, bezindig. Mysticism knows about the eternal force of the night. Only when everything central disappears in the night do the nonsense with things become visible and God approaches man. Night is part of day and death is part of life. The first stanza of a poem entitled Night Song sings, an animal face frozen by blueness, her sanctity mighty is the silence in the stone. Which animal face could be meant here? It freezes from the sanctity of blueness. The face of the animal collects in the torpor. This animal restrains itself to contemplate the sacred in its mighty silence. The third stanza gives us another hint. I quote again. O oh, you, silent mirror of truth, at the lonely ivory temple, appear the reflection of fallen angels. End of quote. 
In the mirror of truth, this animal looks at the sacred. The reality of this beast is fake and facilitating. It is the animal that has not yet been determined. Man, as anima rationalis, the reflection of fallen angels reminds us of paradise lost in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The silence is mighty in the stone. The stone is the mountains of pain. Man becomes mortal the moment he beheld the blueness of divine holiness. Life is painful. Another poem, Night Song, says, Hit me pain. The wound is glowing. I don't care about this torment. See, blooms from my wounds a mysterious star at night. Meet me, Tess. I am done. End of quote. Pain of finitude is sung about by the poet. His pain is a burning wound. He does not heed this torment of finitude because he has become mortal. Man is the mortal, established. To be mortal means to be struck by death and thus to know about it. And from this painful knowledge, a mysterious star blooms at night. Which star this is, we will find out later. If death is part of life, then life does not end with death. The night does not only bring death near. Her darkness is also the darkness of lust and eroticism. Life emerges from the night in the dark. Quote Heidegger again. Quote Heidegger Trago. <clears throat> the blue night has risen gently on our foreheads. Our decomposed hands gently touch the sweet bride. End of quote. The night is blue because it is the holy night of the wedding. The poet sings of the sweet bride. The hands are rotten. Marriage means the end of childhood. The night is the time of the dark games of lust. In another poem at night, Trago thinks. Two of my eyes went out that night. The red gold of my heart. Oh, how quietly the love burned. Your blue cloak encircled the thinking. The thinking. Your red mouth sealed your friend's derangement. Red gold in your red mouth, the still burning love. Red is the color of blood, of love, of life. The poet sings the night. I think you out chasm, night storm, towering mountains. You, great towers, overflowing with infernal grimaces, fiery creatures, rough ferns, spruces, crystal flowers infinite movement. That you hunted God, gentle spirit, sighing in the waterfall, waving pines. In this poem, Trago sings you the wild chasm, Zerklüftung. The wild chasm is the gentle spirit that hunts God, with the mortality of man, being as a whole, breaks apart. The sensuous and supersensible, the finite and the infinite, man and nature, man and God, Everywhere is only chasm, but the chasm is also the clearing or opening up in which beings can be called into unconcealment. Infinite is the torment of original sin. In the second stanza, the poet thinks, quote again, the highest place golden of the people's around. Over blackish cliffs falls dead drunk the glowing bright of the wind, the blue wave of the glacier, and it booms powerful the bell in the valley. Flames, curses, and the dark ones, end of lust, storm the sky, petrified head. Petrified head, the head of the unidentified beast, storms the sky and hunts down God. This poet sings here, sings here of the night of the escape gods. It's the time of perfect nihilism that he experienced in the horrors of the First World War, and that would rob him of his life. Eclipse of God is also the infinite torment. Without the divine, there can be no mortals, and without mortality, man loses his essence. In another nocturnal song, the death motives matter. The seal is captioned, kept, captioned summer. In the evening, the complaint is silent. The cuckoo in the forest. The corn bends lower, the red poppy. 
Black thunderstorm threatens over the hill. The old song of the cricket dies in the field. Leaves never stir the chestnut. On the spiral staircase does your dress wrestle. The candles lit in silence in the dark room. A silver hand wiped them out on starless night. The night is windless, starless, dark and threatening. Poem seems clear. The poet sings of summer and yet there is no light. Black thunderstorms get and threatens. Everything becomes still and silent. The leaves of the chestnut no longer stir. The cuckoo's lament falls silent. Trackel doesn't mention the wind, but we feel its nearness in the tilting of the grain that presses down the poppies. There is an unbearable tension. But in the house on the spiral staircase, your dress rustles. It's a woman's dress, the sweet bride. The last anthem seems quite clear. A silver hand extinguishes a candle. But if we listen more closely, the implicitness disappears. Out on dark paths we wandered, but now we have come home. The settering thunderstorm is ruled out and the sound of our beloved stress welcomes us. It becomes dead quiet. It's not completely dark and gloomy because a candle is lit quietly. But can silence shine? Isn't it the light of the candle that shines? But the candle shines in the dark room. The candle no longer lights the room. She was extinguished by a silver hand. It's a windless, starless night. This phrase reinforces the darkness of the room. A silver hand, whose is it? And could the candle be the soul of our loved ones? Was the rustling of the dress the ringing of her death knells? Is it, the silver, is it the silver hand, the green, the grim reaper's hand that steals life and extinguishes the light of the candles with the gentlest touch? These should all remain open questions. The poet thinks and the thinker can only ponder his poems. The final line of the poem song is meant to give us hope. The burden of mortality is unbearable with no hope of redemption. Just one sentence of it. God's golden eyes open silently over the side of the skull. The side of the skull is the time of the escape gods. The golden eyes of the coming god open silently because he has not yet been called near by the poet. Like Hölderlin and Heidegger, Trago could only prepare for his coming. Well, that's it. Uh, So <clears throat> we're getting on with the time as well. So I'm just taking a sip of water. It's uh, I hope you liked it anyway. Uh, you could write much longer text about these things, but I didn't want to do something uh, too uh, too large in a sense, too big for the occasion, maybe. That might be a way of doing things. Uh, might uh, do it every uh, every time when we're doing this uh, question and answers live streaming. A small lecture that we could go over. Yes. Uh, if you're interested, uh, let me know and I can send you the text if you want to read it at your leisure. Yes, yeah, so I have a set task, uh, Michael. Heidegger's inexhaustible, so <laughs> I will never get to the end of it. It's kind of fun to do all these different things. Uh, reading, being in time with a group, uh, and uh, well, I'll see if I can put together a short list quickly. Uh, 
um, if you uh, well, if you can send me an email, then I have your email address and I can send you the text. That might be the easiest way of doing it. Or uh, you can send me a, a message on Facebook. From some of you, I'm sure I have the email addresses, but I'm not sure of uh, everybody. Uh, if, if I have them of everybody who's here. So, uh, well, we're almost uh, at the end of it. Uh, so drop me a line if you want to read it, and I'll send it. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for uh, making this possible again. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And let's see. Uh, there's another one coming up in November. Uh, I might do a little lecture then on the Heidegger's notion of Heimat. Might fit the bill as well. Uh, so have a nice uh, evening and uh, hope to see you again at some point and uh, I'm sure some of you I will see you again uh, on Monday so see you soon uh, I'll try to finish the the streaming and then uh, <laughs> we can uh, we'll meet again so one more time thank you to all who have been here while I was talking. See you soon.